Today we honor Franklin Dewey Richards and his families. Franklin Dewey Richards was born 2 April 1821 at Richmond, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, son of Phineas Richards and Wealthy Dewey, was a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles from 1849 to 1899. He was the fourth of his father's nine children. Being raised on a farm, he became at an early age accustomed to heavy labor, but used all the spare time he had for getting an education and laying up treasures of knowledge. Before he was ten years old, he had read every book in the Sunday school, comprising some scores of volumes, and when thirteen years old, spent a winter at Lenox Academy. His parents, being devout and respected Congregationalists, trained their children in the pious way, and Franklin was early in life impressed with solemn views on religion. His ideas in regard to many scriptural points was, however, very different from those entertained by most other people with whom he associated, and this caused him to decline a special offer made to him to be educated for the ministry in a leading New England college. In the summer of 1836, Elder Joseph and Brigham Young came from Ohio to Richmond as messengers of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They left a copy of the Book of Mormon with the Richards family, and it was carefully and intelligently perused. Franklin brought all the ardor of his studious mind to bear upon it, and after having studied it carefully, accepted it as a truth and believed. In the autumn of that year, 1836, Willard and Levi Richards went to Kirtland, Ohio, as delegates and leaders of the family to the truth. They accepted the gospel and remained. In the succeeding April, Phineas, with Franklin's youngest brother, George Spencer, aged 14 years, also journeyed to Kirtland. They, in turn, received and acknowledged the truth. In the autumn of 1837, Phineas returned to Richmond. He found Franklin awaiting baptism, and on the third day of June, 1838, Phineas had the pleasure of immersing his son within the waters of Mill Creek in Richmond, his native town. Franklin abandoned his employment and left Richmond for far west Missouri, October 22, 1838. It was a lonely, toilsome journey. On the 30th of October, he crossed the Alleghenies, and almost at the same hour, his beloved brother, George Spencer Richards, was slain by an assassin mob at Hans Mill. But the news of his brother's tragic death and the hideous stories of the Mormon War were alike powerless to restrain his purpose, and he journeyed on eventfully. After visiting far west and gaining confirmation of his faith, he found employment along the Mississippi River. In May 1839, he first met the prophet Joseph, and the following spring, April 9, 1840, he was ordained to the calling of a seventy by Joseph Young and was appointed to a mission in northern Indiana. He journeyed and preached with great success established by his own personal efforts a branch of the church in Porter County, and before he was twenty years of age, delivered at Plymouth a series of public lectures which attracted much attention. The April Conference for the year 1841 saw him at Nauvoo, an adoring witness to the laying of the cornerstone of the temple, and at this eventful gathering, he was called to renew his labors in the region of northern Indiana. In the summer of that year, he was at Laporte, Indiana, sick nigh unto death, and yet determined to progress with his mission. He found consoling care in the kindly home of Isaac Snyder, and through several weeks he was nursed as a beloved son of the house. 
When the family of Father Snyder took up its march for Nauvoo, Franklin was carried back by them to the beautiful city. But soon after the succeeding October conference, he was once more moving in the missionary field, this time being the companion of Phineas H. Young in Cincinnati and its vicinity. He fortunately visited Father Snyder's family again in the summer of 1842, just as he was convalescing from an almost fatal attack of typhoid fever. In December of that year, he was wedded to the youngest daughter of the house, Jane Snyder. He remained with the saints at Nauvoo until the latter part of May 1844, having been ordained a high priest by Brigham Young, May 17, 1844, at Nauvoo. He was called to depart upon a mission to England, accompanied by Apostle Brigham Young and others. He traveled to the Atlantic States, but before setting sail for Europe, he heard the dreadful news of the Carthage tragedy and was called back to Nauvoo. The opening months of the next year, 1845, were sent by him in traveling more than a thousand miles among the branches of the church in Michigan and elsewhere to gather donations for the temple. He returned to Nauvoo with nearly $500 for the sacred purpose and then was chosen by his uncle Willard to be a scribe in the office of the church historian. He also labored through the spring of 1846 as a carpenter and a joiner in the lower main court of the temple until the structure was completed and dedicated, having previously received his endowment and participated in the administration of the sacred ordinances therein. When these duties were concluded and the time for the exodus had come, he sacrificed the pleasant little home built by his own toil and with the meager proceeds he purchased a wagon and cart and such few necessaries as he could compass for the use of his family, an invalid wife and baby girl. With the heroism of the martyrs, he saw his loved ones starting on that melancholy journey into the western wilderness. He committed them to the great Creator's care, and then he turned his face resolutely towards the east to fill his mission to England. Without money or sufficient, to make his way by faith alone across continent and ocean into a strange land. His younger brother Samuel was called to accompany him, and the two missionaries crossed the river to Nauvoo and slept the first night of their arduous journey in a deserted building there. The God whom they so unselfishly served opened their way. They pursued their journey via the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to Pittsburgh and across the mountains to the coast. And on September 22, 1846, they sailed from New York in company with Apostle Parley P. Pratt and others. The last words which Franklin received from the camp of Israel before the ship put to sea was that his wife Jane, amidst all the privations of the Exodus, was lying at the point of death, that a little son had been born to her, but the child had quietly expired upon its mother's devoted bosom. He landed in Liverpool October 14, 1846. A few days later he was appointed to preside over the mission in Scotland with his brother Samuel as his assistant. Apostle Orson Hyde was at this epoch the president of the British mission and the editor of the Millennial Star, though he was soon to depart for America and was to be succeeded by Elder Orson Spencer. But at the hour when the change was expected to be made, a false report of Elder Spencer's death reached Liverpool. The rumor was believed and Apostle Hyde appointed Franklin, then only 21 years old, to both of the positions which he himself was vacating. But just as he was entering into this high trust, Elder Spencer arrived in England. Franklin was then chosen to be one of his counselors, and during the subsequent serious illness of the president, Franklin was obliged to sustain the responsibilities and perform the duties of that calling. 
He labored there until February 20, 1848, when he was appointed to take charge of a large company of saints who were emigrating to the Rocky Mountains across the Atlantic in the ship Carnatic. During the time of Franklin's stay in the British Isles, the saints there had been relieved of the treacherous joint stock company. The dishonest projectors of this despicable scheme had fled to other regions and hope and confidence again held sway. But while all the missions were prosperous, the young elder could justly feel proud and happy at the great work of proselyting, melancholy news came to him from the wilderness. His brother, Joseph William Richards, a member of the Mormon battalion, had succumbed to the rigors of the march and his weary form had been laid in a lonely grave by the banks of the Arkansas River. Franklin's little daughter, Wealthy, had also died and left his wife heartbroken, childish, and alone. The homeward journey via New Orleans and St. Louis to winter quarters was completed by the middle of May, 1848, and there Franklin found his wife and such of their relatives as had survived the perils and privations of the time. In June, he was sent through western Iowa, negotiating for cattle with which to move the company of Willard Richards across the plains to the Salt Lake Basin. His effort was completely successful, and on the 5th of July, the train started, with Franklin acting as captain over 50 wagons. The journey was a most distressful one to his wife. Much of the time it seemed as though each day would be her last, but they found kind and helpful friends who ministered to their wants, and on the 19th of October they entered the valley through Emigration Canyon and camped in the fort. More grateful to God than words can express to find a resting place for wearied frames worn with toil and sickness. Franklin sold his cloak and every other article of clothing which he could spare, and with the proceeds purchased building materials. Before the violence of the winter was felt, he was able to construct a small room of adobes without roof and without floor. From this rude mansion on the succeeding 12th day of February, he was called to receive his ordination to the apostleship. Heber C. Kimball was spokesman to this ordination. The young apostle became immediately associated with the other leading minds of the community in the provisional government of Deseret in general legislative and ecclesiastical work and the labors on creating a perpetual emigration fund. In October 1849, he was once more called to leave home with its tender ties and its responsibilities of love and renew his great missionary labor in the British Isles. He traveled in the company with apostles John Taylor, Lorenzo and Erastus Snow and others and had a most eventful journey. Hostile Indians, inclement weather and turbulent icy screens combined to delay and impair their progress. But the hand of providence protected them and the opening month of the year of 1850 found them at St. Louis visiting with dear old friends and brethren. This was among the grandest missionary movements in the history of the church. Elder Taylor was on his way to France. Lorenzo and Erastus Snow were destined for Italy and Scandinavia, and Franklin was to officiate once more in the British mission. Orson Pratt has been presiding and editing at Liverpool. But when Franklin arrived there, March 29, 1850, he found that the elder apostle had been called on a hurried trip to Council Bluffs, and the star con contained a notification that during his absence, Apostle Franklin D. Richards would preside over the church affairs in Great Britain. The young president immediately began the establishment of the Perpetual Immigration Fund and founded upon the basis which enabled its beneficent power to endure. Later in the season, Orson Pratt returned to England, and Franklin relinquished his place as chief and became Apostle Pratt's associate for a few months. 
But with the opening of the next year, 1851, Orson was called to the valley and Apostle Richards was instated as the president. Within 12 months following, his energy and zeal with that of his brethren had spread the truth with irresistible sway throughout the Isles of Britain, while Franklin, with tireless hand and brain, doubled the business at the Liverpool office, revised and enlarged the hymn book, and printed an edition of 25,000 copies, prepared his pamphlet, The Pearl of Great Price, stereotyped the Book of Mormon, and arranged for stereotyping the Doctrine and Covenants issued a new edition of Parley P. Pratt's Voice of Warning and devised a plan which made the star a weekly instead of a semi-monthly periodical and increased the number of its issue. He had also paid an interesting visit to Apostle Taylor at Paris and had sent to Zion the first company of saints whose passage came through the emigration fund with Apostle Erastus Snow had made arrangements for the organization of a company to engage in the manufacture of iron in Utah. In January 1852, pursuant to advice from the First Presidency of the Church, who contemplated a visit from him to Great Salt Lake Valley, he installed in the Liverpool office his brother Samuel, who had been formerly his associate during his ardent and successful Scottish ministry, in order to fit the younger Richards to maintain the increasing work in Franklin's temporary absence. The baptisms in the British mission during these two years of Franklin's stupendous labor extended from the summer of 1850 to the close of the spring of 1852, aggregating about 16,000 while the perfect organization of conferences, branches, pastorates, etc. was commensurated with his marvelous increase. After exhaustive investigation, Franklin rejected the theory of emigrating the saints by way of Panama to the California coast and, and instead adopted the project of sending one ship to each of the three ports, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. The last received and decided preference after the experiment and the plan of voyage between Liverpool and Castle Garden instituted by Apostle Franklin D. Richards for the European saints a half a century since is still the universal favorite route. He sailed from Liverpool for New York May 8, 1852 and arrived safely in Salt Lake City August 20th. A few days later, August 29th, he was attending a special conference held in Salt Lake City, at which was promulgated to the world-famous revelation which Franklin had long heard before and received upon the subject of the eternal and plurality of the marriage covenant. In the Territorial Legislative Assembly, he renewed his labors as a lawmaker. December 13, 1852, and in the opening year of 1853, he participated in the dedication of the temple grounds at Salt Lake City, and also the laying of its cornerstones. In the succeeding month of July, he journeyed with his wife Jane and their two children to Iron County to proceed with the establishment of the ironworks, and on the trip encountered, but without any immediate disaster, several parties of hostile Indians. At Cedar City, military orders were received from Governor Young and Lieutenant General Wells in view of the Indian disturbances, and Franklin continued assiduously to the work of bringing in the outposts, changing the site of Cedar City and fitting the people for the resistance of savage aggressions. He returned to his home in Salt Lake City just in time to soothe the closing hours of his mother's life, but was again on the march for the Iron Region on the 22nd of October. His mission there was accomplished. He came to Salt Lake City to take part through the winter in the legislative councils, and while less engaged, he was requested by President Young to prepare for another mission to Europe. Just before departing for England, he held a family gathering at which he set the example of dedicating his home and all he possessed to the Lord. 
He reached Liverpool in safety June 4, 1854. His letter of appointment from the First Presidency, published in the Millennial Star, authorized him to preside over all the conferences and all the affairs of the Church in the British Isles and adjacent countries. This was the signal for the closer amalgamation of the European missions under one head. He traveled on the continent, promoting peace and harmony as well as increase to the branches there. Emigration facilities were perfected and enlarged. In 1855, he engaged for the better accommodation of the growing business in Liverpool, the convenient premises known now as 42 Islington, which have been occupied as the chief offices of the church in Europe. In October of this year, the German mission was originally established in Dresden under his personal direction, a mission which has yielded intelligence and numerical strength to the cause. His travels were constant and extended to nearly every part of Western Europe until he was probably better informed than any other man regarding the work in foreign lands. He gathered around him a most devoted band of American and foreign elders, and the cause progressed amazingly. It was also within his province to direct the branches of the church in the East Indies, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and other parts, making altogether a sphere which no man could fill unless every ambition were centered in the cause. July 26, 1856, President Richards, accompanied by Elder Cyrus H. Wheelock, sailed from Liverpool, homeward bound on the steamer Asia. At a meeting of the presidents of conferences held in London previous to his departure, an affectionate and glowing tribute of esteem was unanimously dedicated to him. October 4, 1856, he arrived once more in his mountain home and in December became again a member of the Utah Legislature. January 5, 1857, he was again elected a regent of the University of Deseret. On Monday, April 20, 1857, he was elected and commissioned Brigadier General of the 2nd Brigade of Infantry of the Nauvoo Legion. Soon afterwards, he paid a visit of observation with other dignitaries to Fort Limhi, now in Idaho. When the coming of Johnson's army was announced, Brigadier General Richards was called into council upon measures for public safety and defense, and later was engaged with a detachment of men from his brigade in giving support to Lieutenant General Wells in Echo Canyon. He, with other devoted citizens, left his valuable property under the charge of a trusty friend who was to apply the torch and offer it all as a burning sacrifice before it should be seized or desecrated by the boastful invaders. And after the tragic folly of the invasion was brought to its proper close, he, with others, received a somewhat unnecessary pardon from James Buchanan, President of the United States. July 21, 1859, he began a political tour through southern Utah to advise and arrange for the election of delegate to Congress. And immediately upon his return to Salt Lake City, he departed with Elder John Taylor to meet two companies of emigrants, many of whom were endeared by old and affectionate associations with Apostle Taylor and Richards. During the years 1859 to 1866, his labors were multifarious. He was engaged in ecclesiastical, political, legislative, military, and educational works, besides having a large family responsibility and such growing private interests of agriculture and mill building as his public duties would permit him to inaugurate. He was upon three occasions very ill, but each time he recuperated and renewed his labor with increased energy. July 29, 1866, he was once more appointed to England, and in a fortnight was on his journey. 
arriving in Liverpool on the 11th of September following. He began the welcome and grateful labor of visiting the principal conferences of the European mission, including the Scandinavian and other continental conferences. In July 1867, he was again instated as president of the European mission. Once more, he gathered a staff and enthusiastic elders to his support, and in the following year, in Great Britain alone, 3,457 souls were baptized, and in the same length of time, from the same country, there were immigrated to Utah, more than 3,200 saints, always projecting his thoughts into the future to find means of advancing the work of God. He at this time decided that immigrating by sailing vessels was inadequate for the needs of his renewed proselyting work in Europe. He therefore made the necessary changes, at that early day not inconsiderable, and two large companies of saints were sent out from Liverpool by steamships, Minnesota and Colorado, bound for New York. This was the last foreign mission of Apostle Richards, and his active work in the field had a fitting close. Eight times he had crossed the mighty deep and four eventful periods he had spent in the ministry abroad. His last effort had demonstrated that the soil of humanity in Europe would still produce rich fruits. Although his ardor as a missionary had not waned, his value as a home counselor had increased, and by the opening of the following year, a new epic was commenced in his career. He was elected probate judge of Weber County, February 19, 1869, and from that event, Ogden and Weber County may date no small share of the worthy progress which was made them respectively in importance the second city and county in Utah. In May 1869, Franklin D. Richard established his residence in Ogden. In all the intervening years, he had been the presiding ecclesiastical authority of the Weaver Stake of Zion. Many of his assisted laborers possessed a measure of his own paramount quality of generous loyalty to the cause, and these men came readily to his support in the revival work of the home ministry. When he reached Ogden to attend his first term in court, the town had no newspaper, before a year had passed, he established and for a time edited the Ogden Junction, over which he exercised a guardian care for several years. Schools had been all that the people felt they could support, but they were still not up to a high grade. He wrote, preached, and labored personally, and with his accustomed success, to advance the educational interest of the people. The young people in many cases lack cultured associations and ambition for education and refinement. He organized societies which were the heralds, if not the direct progenitors, of the later Mutual Improvement Association, which permeate the young and growing state of Utah. And he originated a plan by which the youth of Weber County might hear, without cost, lectures by the best scientists and most talented orators of Utah. With the advent of the railway came an influx of worldly persons and sentiment. He taught the saints how to preserve from this rude aggression their political and moral integrity, and he showed them by precept and example how to make home beautiful and home pleasures attractive for the youth. He was probate and county judge of Weber County continuously from March 1, 1869 until September 25, 1883. During this period of more than 14 years, hundreds of suits for divorce and cases of estates for settlement were brought before him. In no single instance was his decision in these matters reversed by a higher tribunal. He educated all the land titles in the important city of Ogden and the populous towns of Huntsville, North Ogden, and Plain City. No one of these educations has ever been set aside by any court. For the first five years following his induction into office, 
His court had original and appellate jurisdiction in all common law and chancery cases. Before him were tried numerous civil suits, habeas corpus cases, and trials of offenders charged with all crimes from misdemeanor to murder. Not one single judgment or decree rendered by him in all this lengthy general judicial service was reversed on appeal. His justice and humanity, united with keen legal sense, made his name proverbial. In his administration of county financial affairs, he was no less successful. Aided by associates of shrewdness and integrity, during his regime, the finest courthouse in Utah was erected in Ogden. Roads and bridges innumerable were built. The only toll road in the county, extending through the magnificent Ogden Canyon, was purchased and made free. Taxes were kept low, but were collected promptly. The county was maintained clear of debt. His position carried with it no salary. Although Apostle Richards always had a mass of business at home, he found time to travel and observe throughout the territory. He continued as he had previously been when in Utah, a member of the successive legislative assemblies and constitutional conventions in which his scholarship, legal lore, and patriotism made him conspicuous. In 1877, he traveled with President Young to organize nearly all the stakes of Zion and attended the dedication on temple sites and temple buildings. After the death of President Young, and especially since his own retirement from political life, Franklin was entirely immersed in the councils and labors of the church. In the summer of 1882, Congress passed what is known as the Hoare Amendment, which authorized the governor of the territory to fill vacancies caused by the failure to elect officers at the August election, 1882. Under claim of authority from this act, Governor Murray appointed some scores of persons to fill offices throughout the territory, and among them James N. Kimball was appointed to be probate judge of Weber County. After demanding the office from Franklin D. Richards, he commenced a mandamus suit to compel the relinquishment of the office and records to him. Franklin denied that there was any vacancy in the office because of the failure to hold the election and insisted that he had the right under his commission to hold the office until his successor was elected and qualified. The district court decided in favor of Mr. Kimball, but an appeal was taken to the Supreme Court of the Territory where the decision of the lower court was affirmed. The case was then taken to the Supreme Court of the United States, where it rested until the term expired for which Mr. Kimball was appointed and until Judge Richard's successor was elected and qualified. This was a test case, and if it had not been contested with the determination and skill which characterized the defense, the result would have been the displacement of all the officers of the territory by the governor's appointees and the Liberal Party would have gained the political control of the territory. This determined legal contest was a fitting close to the successful official career of Judge Richards and saved the territory from political bondage. At the General Conference of the Church held in April 1889, Elder Richards was sustained as church historian and general church recorder Having previously acted as assistant historian for many years, this position he filled with much devotion and faithfulness until his demise. On November 21, 1894, the Genealogical Society of Utah was incorporated and Franklin became its first president. He donated the first books as the beginning of the library, which was housed in his office in the old historian's office at 60 East South Temple. In 1898, when Lorenzo Snow became president of the church, Brother Richard succeeded to the presidency of the Twelve Apostles 
and occupied that position until his death. He was endeared to his associates in the priesthood and the saints generally because of his kind, affable manner. During the later years of his life, his time was chiefly occupied with historical and genealogical labors, but he visited many of the stakes of Zion and remained zealous and industrious to the last. In the fall of 1899, he became enfeebled through strokes of paralysis, and after an illness of several weeks, accompanied by brief spells of impaired improvement, he passed away quietly at his home in Ogden, Utah, Saturday, December 9, 1899. President Richards was noted for the kindness of his heart and the gentleness of his manners and his constant unceasing devotion to the work of God. Among the glowing tributes of respect to his character and faith made at the time of his funeral were the remarks of President Joseph F. Smith, who said that he had seen President Richards under such trying ordeals that few could endure, but under which Brother Richards had shown the patient submission, faith, and devotion of Job, when he exclaimed, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He was buried Tuesday, 12 December, 1899, in the Ogden City Cemetery. Franklin Dewey Richards and Jane Snyder were the parents of six children, four sons and two daughters as follows. Wealthy Louisa Richards was born November 2nd, 1843, at Nauvoo, Hancock County, Illinois, and died 14 September, 1846, age two. Isaac Phineas Richards was born July 23, 1846 in Iowa, about 72 miles west of Nauvoo, and died July 23, 1846, age one day. He was buried Tuesday, August 4, 1846 at Mount Pisgah. Franklin Snyder Richards was born June 20, 1849 at Salt Lake City, and married December 18, 1868, in the endowment house, Emily Sophia Tanner. She bore him five children. Franklin Snyder Richards also married Jane Harrington and Elizabeth Eastman. Franklin S. died September 7, 1934, age 85, at Salt Lake City, and was buried September 9th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Josephine Richards was born May 25, 1853, at the Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was married March 4, 1873, in the Endowment House to Joseph Alba West. She bore him eight children. She died April 23, 1933, aged 79, at Logan, Cache County, Utah, and was buried April 26th at Ogden. Lorenzo Mazur Richard was born July 5th, 1857 at Salt Lake City and was married October 16th, 1876 in the endowment house to Mary Maria Dunford. She bore him three children. He died December 21, 1883 at Ogden and is buried in the Ogden City Cemetery. Charles Comstock Richards was born September 16, 1859 at Salt Lake City and was married December 18, 1877 in the Endowment House to Louisa Letitia Perry. She bore him eight children. He died August 10, 1953 at Salt Lake City and was buried August 13 in the Ogden City Cemetery. Franklin Dewey Richards and Sarah Snyder were the parents of two children. Robert Richards, stillborn, 8 October, 1850, at Salt Lake City. Lucy Richards, born 1 January, 1854, at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake, Utah, died 26 January, 1854. Franklin Dewey Richards and Charlotte Fox were the parents of six children, four sons and two daughters, as follows. Mary Ellen Richards was born June 30, 1850, at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was married May 25, 1867, in the Salt Lake Endowment House, 
to Thomas George Weber. She bore him six children. She died August 29, 1929, in Salt Lake City. Erastus Snow Richards was born May 25, 1853, at Salt Lake City, and was married December 9, 1876, in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Priscinda Nebaker. She bore him four children. He died November 21, 1939, at Los Angeles. George Albert Richard was born August 12, 1858, at Salt Lake City, and died January 22, 1908, age 49, at Salt Lake City. Ezra Taft Richard was born 17 April, 1860, at Salt Lake City, and died June 8, 1866, age 6, at Salt Lake City. Millie Fox Richards was born February 16, 1862, at Salt Lake City, and died July 19, 1865, age 3, at Salt Lake City. Harvey Selman Richards was born November 21, 1866, at Salt Lake City, and died in 1868, age two at Salt Lake City. Franklin Dewey Richards and Susan Sanford Pearson were the parents of three children, two sons and one daughter, as follows. Nancy Eliza Richards was born December 1st, 1857 at Salt Lake City and was married February 25th, 1878 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Marion Fraser. She bore him 10 children. Nancy died October 28, 1935, age 77, at Oakley, Summit County, Utah, and was buried there October 31st. Albert Damon Richard was born April 30, 1860, at Salt Lake City, and was married November 14, 1880, at Wanship, Summit County, Utah, to Annie Elizabeth Harris. She bore him five children. He was married November 2, 1899, in the Salt Lake Temple to Louisa Foreman Beers. She bore him one child. Albert was married February 20, 1902, in the Salt Lake Temple to Emily Treharn Ashton. She bore him three children. Albert died June 15, 1945, age 85, at Oakley, and was buried there June 19. William Pearson Richards was born May 18, 1864, at Hoytsville, Pex Creek, Summit County, Utah, and was married January 9, 1895, in the Salt Lake Temple, to Leah Smithies. She bore him four children. William died September 20, 1946, age 82, at Camas, and was buried at Francis, Summit County, Utah, September 23rd. Franklin Dewey Richards and Laura Alpha Snyder were the parents of one child. Samuel Jesse Richards was born August 9, 1860 at West Jordan, Salt Lake County, Utah, and died April 28, 1898. Franklin Dewey Richards and Nanny Longstroth were the parents of three children, two sons and one daughter, as follows. Minerva Edmaressa Richards was born May 11, 1858 at Salt Lake City and was married September 14, 1882 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Benjamin Franklin Knowlton. She bore him seven children. Minerva died May 28, 1936, age 78 at Salt Lake City and was buried at Farmington. George Franklin Richards was born February 23, 1861 at Farmington and was married March 9, 1882 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Alice Almira Robinson. She bore him 15 children. George Franklin Richards died August 8, 1950, age 89 at Salt Lake City and was buried August 11 in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Frederick William Richards was born April 27, 1866 at Farmington and was married April 2, 1885 at Salt Lake City to Caroline Lobb. She bore him nine children. He died December 7, 
1945, age 79, at Salt Lake City, and was buried December 10 in the Wasatch Lawn Cemetery at Holiday, Salt Lake County, Utah. Franklin Dewey Richards and Mary Thompson were the parents of four children, two sons and two daughters, as follows. Myron John Richards was born May 22, 1858 at Provo and was married July 3, 1879 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Julia Anna Peterson. She bore him four children. He was married April 29, 1885 in the Logan Temple to Isabella Mary Young. She bore him six children. Myron died August 7, 1938 at Garland, Box Elder County, Utah, age 80, and was buried August 9 in the Farmington City Cemetery. Welp T. Richards was born March 22, 1861 at Farmington, Utah, and was married September 25, 1879 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Edward Barrett Clark. Welp T. died May 11, 1940, age 79, at Farmington and was buried there May 15. Mary Alice Richards was born July 5, 1863, at Farmington, Davis County, Utah, and was married and sealed December 8, 1881, in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Joseph Echo Stevenson. She bore him seven children. He died June 23rd. 1929 at Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, California, and was buried there in the Oakwood Cemetery, June 27. Mary Alice died February 13, 1926, age 62, at Riverton, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was buried February 16 at Farmington. Wilford Woodruff Richard was born 8 May. 1866 at Farmington and was married March 28, 1888 in the Logan Temple to Emily Randall. She bore him 12 children. Wilford died September 6, 1912, age 46 at Paris, Bear Lake County, Idaho, and was buried September 9 at Farmington. Franklin Dewey Richards and Rhoda Harriet Foss were the parents of four children three sons and one daughter as follows. Hiram Franklin Richards was born December 14, 1857 at Farmington, died 15 December 1877, age 20. Ira Foss Carter Richards was born July 27, 1860 at Farmington and died June 9, 1864, age 3 at Farmington. Ezra Foss Richards, a twin, was born July 27, 1860 at Farmington and was married February 5, 1891 in the Logan Temple to Amanda Lydia Reeder. She bore him eight children. Ezra died February 1, 1930, age 69 at Farmington and was buried there February 4. Sarah Elizabeth Richards was born October 31, 1862, at Farmington, Davis County, Utah, and was married and sealed January 26, 1882, in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Lauren J. Robinson. She bore him 11 children. Sarah died August 5, 1925, aged 62 at Bountiful, Davis County, and was buried August 8 at Farmington. Total known posterity of Franklin Dewey Richards as of 19 August 1994, 29 children, 144 grandchildren, 420 great-grandchildren, 1,109 second great-grandchildren, 849 third great-grandchildren, 89 fourth great-grandchildren, for a total posterity of 2,640. 1,118 total spouses of children, grandchildren, etc., making a total posterity, including spouses, of 3,758. As descendants of these fine and faithful people, let us remember their strong, wonderful qualities and try to live our lives to make them proud of us. Mm -hmm.